Let's bring in the coach now. We're having coffee with the coach. He's gone from a morning appearance to supper time over there in Europe. How are you doing, coach? I'm doing great, Rod. Hey, what is this about me scaring away your stars? I've been I've been accused of a lot of things, Rod, but never scaring away stars, man. What's going on? No, not you. The, did you see what Willie Jefferson said on Friday? He said Ryder fans didn't respect his privacy and is a breath of fresh air going to Winnipeg where they don't bother him or they'll at least let him do his private thing before signing autographs. And it's got Ryder fans all upset. Can you imagine? Did you have Ty Cats fans uh, up in your face for autographs and stuff? What? You know, you've coached in all these markets. Rod, I'm going to go back to something my father taught me a long, long time ago. And, uh, you know, he was 30 years in professional baseball. And I heard him say this once to some young players. He said, remember, there's going to come a time when they don't ask anymore. And you better treat them that way. And I get what you're saying. Yes, there is a there is a point where you need to respect a person's privacy. I'm all about that. But I also think it's real important that we all understand that it's they who buy the tickets, that pay our salaries, that do all that kind of thing. And you know, as a passionate fan, you have you don't have a right, but it's as a player and a and a coach or anybody in the industry, you have to understand you know, that you're very privileged to have the job that you have. And there is going to come a day when somebody else is going to sit in that chair or take that place on the field or, and, and uh, they won't ask anymore. And, you know, if that's what you want, then that's okay. But just recognize what you're, when you, when you make those comments, what you're saying. No, oh, oh my God, I could talk about this all day. And, and uh, yeah. maybe we will another time. <laughs> But, I mean, you've never coached in Saskatchewan. You wouldn't be able, Jeff, to walk two inches in that town. I'm telling you right now, you wouldn't. You would get tired of it. You know what? I, it's, it's interesting you say that because I've got a number of friends who have, and I've asked them that question a number of times about what it, you know, for example, Tommy Condell or, you know, any of the guys that I know that have worked in Saskatchewan. And, you know, they said it is amazing experience because it's i mean they are football 24 7. i think it's probably when i talk to guys uh, jeff jagosinski who uh, is a friend of mine who worked for the packers and he's a wisconsin guy so he's a wisconsin kid who grew up a packer fan and, and had worked for the packers and mike sherman and won super bowls there and he said the same thing he said when you go to the when you go to the grocery store your wife's going to be asked about you know the second quarterback or the third left guard or whatever and he said it is difficult to get away from it and it can suffocate you at times but you know both of those guys you know said the same thing it is a mate when it's good it's amazing and when it's bad sometimes it can be tough oh yeah absolutely so uh hey just one more cfl question because we brought you on to talk nfl and the, the viewers want to know the alouettes thing how that came about and why Montreal? What's your association to Kahari and how excited are you to get going in Montreal? Well, I'm excited to get going, Rod. And when I made the decision to not go back, when, or excuse me, to Edmonton, I'm just, wow, listen to me. I'm, I'm going to get the whole Western Division in here before. <laughs> but when I made the right. decision to not go back to Hamilton, uh, you know, a couple of days later, the, the phone started to ring. And, you know, I was offered an opportunity to go to Edmonton. I was offered an opportunity, obviously, Mon to go to Montreal. Um, there were some things down in the USFL and the XFL. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. But as I started to talk to Danny Machocha more and more, you know, I really liked what he had to say about, you know, the commitment to winning there, about what he's trying to get done, about, you know, Kahari. I don't know Kahari other than by reputation and just the little bits I've been around him in the league. But in a, in a nine-team league, everybody kind of knows everybody. And I've been impressed with him as a person. Uh, I, I, I like the way his football team, you know, is drawn to him. I think he's got leader. Yeah, obviously, you don't play quarterback in that league for as long as he did and not have quarter, you know, had a leadership ability. Um, and, you know, and I think it'll be, I think it'll be a nice mix. Um, and, you know, as I do with all my decisions about anything professional, I put them in the hands of my agent and I give it to Paul Sheehy who works for 
ProStar. He owns ProStar in Denver, and he's got a number of NFL clients and CFL clients. And I just say, Paul, I want you to sort through this for me. And he came back to me four or five days later and said, Jeff, I really, I really think you got to take a hard look at Montreal. And that's you know when we made the decision to go that direction. Okay, coach, I've never done this, but can I ask you to stick through a four minute break and come back to the next segment with us? Would you mind? Dude, you're my guy. Even though you got a Buccaneer <laughs> shirt on, you're still my guy. Well, when in Rome. So, hey, I appreciate it. So <laughs> stick with me if you don't mind, because I had a coach DM me this morning, a U.S. college coach, and he's like, what's Coach Reinbold got to say? And I said, tune in. And he said, best coordinator in the CFL, maybe in the game, special teams. And we haven't even picked your brain on football yet. So to please him and me Let's and our it. viewers. All right. I appreciate this guy for sticking with us into hour two. We can kick the shoes off Coach Ryan Bold and get into it. Okay. Thanks for waiting. Alabama, Georgia tonight. That U.S. college coach I was telling you about, I don't want to give his name. Let's just say he's a real sweet guy. And uh, I think you know him. We can't figure out why George is favored by three at betregal.net tonight against Alabama. Because Alabama destroyed him 41-24 in the SEC championship game. This national championship tonight, what do you think about that line and how do you think it's going to play out? I think, I think it's an interesting line. I think that have more has, says what Georgia did to Michigan than what Alabama did to Georgia. And I, you know, again... Those lines tend to be, you know, they change every week. They change every day. And and certainly, Georgia's latest body of work against Michigan was, you know, a beatdown. And I mean a serious beatdown. Michigan looked slow. They looked unathletic. I, I don't think, Rod, you can appreciate just how good SEC defensive linemen are. The biggest difference in college football across the country is in the defensive line. And you go to the SEC. And those are real men. I mean, those are real athletic, big, strong human beings. I heard a coach uh, from the university. We played University of Wisconsin when I was at Hawaii. And uh, Jim Hubner was the offensive line coach at Wisconsin. I talked to him before the game because I've known him for years. And I said, Hubby, how do you like it at Wisconsin? And he said, I, I really like it. we got great kids. He said, but in the Big Ten, most of the what would be defensive linemen in the SEC, you know, are they're just not there. And the offensive linemen in the SEC are playing defensive line in the Big Ten. And I think that's really true. That they're so athletic. They're unbelievably athletic. You look at the the five star ratings, and I'm not a big guy on ratings, recruiting ratings, but Rivals does a star system. There were forty five star players on the Georgia roster. There were five at Michigan. And it really looked like it on game time because Michigan's speed, which was outstanding in the Big Ten, just could not hold up on the edges on a perimeter with, you know, Georgia. And, and I think, you know, the, the place that I give Alabama a, an edge in this game is coaching. I think Saban has been there, done it. He's got outstanding people on his staff. His team knows how to prepare, knows how to play in big games. Georgia got bloodied by, by uh, Alabama the last time they played. It'll be interesting to see whether Kirby Smart and that staff can, you know, what, whether that was going to serve as a wake-up call or whether this will be a reminder of why Alabama is better than Georgia. 41-24, one month ago, December the 7th, that the Crimson Tide won the football game. But correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if anybody's done the stats on this. Somebody must have. There's got to be more SEC players than in the CFL than any other conference. They run rampant across. The well, I think the same thing's true, Rod, in the National Football League. You look around the NFL, and every team you see has outstanding SEC players. You look at, you know, we've had... Jefferson was the was the rookie of the year a year ago, a receiver out of LSU. Well, this year it's probably going to be Jamar Chase, his teammate at LSU. I mean, it, you just go through it. It's, it's football in the South, particularly in the Southeast, the SEC. It is way more than a game. And, you know, until you've coached down there, and I coached in Louisiana, and I will tell you that it is a completely different game. And it is the best athletes with the most, you know, I mean, with this NIL thing that they have in the States now where basically payers, players can be paid, 
the the balance of power is going to shift even further and further away. And the big schools in the SEC, the Alabamas, the Georgias, the Texas A&Ms, the Floridas, they'll just keep getting farther and farther past and farther and farther ahead of everybody else in the country. I know you want to talk about the NFL playoff matchups, but we just got to talk about the firings. Uh, six openings now, as we sit here now, there may be more by the end of the day, but in South Florida, they are outraged at Brian Flores being fired. I'm not joking. Outrage. And I didn't see it coming. Did you? I thought there was a possibility, and I'll tell you why. When you watch the circus that went on around Tua Tagovailoa and Deshaun Watson, and the, are we going to trade for Deshaun, da 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 you know what that told me everything that i needed to know there was obviously a tremendous rift in the organization you know rod having done this for 30 some years i can read the tea leaves pretty well <laughs> and when you see a guy who you took in with the fifth pick in the draft being having to deal with repeated repeated questions about whether are you really going to be the guy here for the long term are you good enough all the stuff that when you openly uh i guess flirt with deshaun watson you're setting yourself up for now that that separation to occur and it, what it told me was that there was a gigantic power struggle going on in miami now I will say this, I think, I think Flores is an outstanding coach. I think that's been proven. But there are some things that make you scratch your head a little bit. And you don't know whether they're Brian Flores, uh, you know, they're the general manager, they're the, you know, the owner, where it's all coming from. But two has been there three years. He's had three different offensive coordinators, three, on three diff in three years. That is, that is really tough on a young quarterback. Now, is the you know and they've had numerous staff changes that's a little bit the belichickian way but is that you know greer is that flores you know where's you know continuity is important in an organization and when you're constantly changing coaches unless you have the structure that new england has and you know here's another thing we can talk about rod how many new england assistant coaches have gone out from fortress patriot and succeeded now, everybody wants a little of that Belichick magic, that Patriot magic, but hey, go through them. Tell me, tell me the ones that have succeeded or uh, more than one, one or two years. You know, Josh McDaniels had a little flirt with success in Denver. Bill O'Brien is now at Alabama trying to get back into the National Football League. I mean, you go through the whole list of them. Brian Flores now three years and fired. Uh, you, you go through the whole list of them and it's basically the same story. And the fact of the matter is the structure in New England is so unique, so very unique, where basically Belichick handles everything. And the owner has some has input, but really stands back and just writes checks. And so it's you can take that out of New England. You can take that, you know, yeah, he can tell you about the structure. He can say you know, this is the way we did it in New England, but are you willing to give that guy, you know, that kind of power? And again, Dave Patricia in, in Detroit. I mean, it's over and over and over. We've heard it, you know, they, they're great young football coaches. They're great coaches. They've been in the proving ground of the NFL. There's no place in history that's had more success than New England's had, and yet, all these bright guys go out of the factory, go out of the laboratory, and can't succeed. Why is it? Because the, you, the it's such a unique environment in New England. And if they can re, re, replicate the entire environment, you might have the success. But it has it's proven to be a failure. Have you had the opportunity to see any of the Man in the Arena documentaries on Tom Brady that's airing right now on ESPN? I have not, but I've been told by a friend of mine it's really good. Cool. Well, yeah. And so it's 20 years of Patriots football. You're talking about Matt Patricia, Charlie Weiss, Romeo Cornell, Josh McDaniel. Where are those guys now? So, yes. Uh, but I will say this, Sam McGuavin. Yeah, go ahead, Coach. 
It's every, it's been every one of them. And, and, you know, it's interesting. You see Sam, wasn't it great to see Sam score a touch, score a touchdown for Miami on the last play of the game yesterday. Uh, so I'm saying, and he loves Flores. He's a Flores guy. So you think there's a few nervous guys in that locker room today with Flores being let go, but Sam will play somewhere. Um, the viewers want to know how you got that sky sports opportunity coach to be the NFL analyst there on that European network. They just, they're enjoying your coverage. How did it come about? I'll tell you what, Rod, like a lot of things in my career have come about, just sheer luck. I mean, for a guy who has no more talent than I have, I've been really, really fortunate. I, here's what happened. I was working for the NFL office in London, England. Uh, I had been fired by Winnipeg, came over to NFL Europe. They asked me to stay and work in the International Player Development Program in, out of London. And I was in the office one day, and the president of the league, Alistair Kirkwood, came down, and he knocked on my door, and he said, Jeff, uh, didn't you do some TV for uh, what, a TSN when, when you got fired in Winnipeg? I said, yeah, I did a little stuff around the, the Great Cup, and I had a weekly you know, NFL News and Notes show. And he said, would you sit in this weekend? Because Sky is a Fox affiliate, and, you know, Brian Baldinger, uh, you know, Troy Aikman, Moose Johnson, all those guys, Darren Woodson, all of them cut their teeth over here. They were using it as a developmental environment for their young broadcasters. And so Darren couldn't make a show and they didn't have enough time to get the paperwork done to get another guy in from the States. So they asked me to sit in. I sat in, did the show and Rod, I prepared, but I did it the way I do everything in my life. I'm not going to obsess about it and sweat about it. I'm going to be me. And if that's not good enough, then they can find another guy. And um, <laughs> it just so happened that one of the big wigs from, from Mr. Murdoch's corporate, Rupert Murdoch's corporation on Fox was in town in London. It was just channel surfing and checking the programming. And he came across our broadcast and uh, they had a, meeting, <laughs> had a meeting on Monday. And I found this out about five years later. And the producer of the NFL show uh, was sitting in the meeting and, and the guy goes around the table and he's telling everybody what he thinks of the programming. And he comes to the NFL show and he goes, all right, who was that blonde guy you had in this week on doing the color? And my, <laughs> my, my producer goes, uh, he was just a fill in. I swear, well, you'll never see him again. Guys never, no, I, I can get rid of him <laughs> tomorrow. And the guy goes, the guy goes, Nah, I kind of like him. Let's keep, let's keep him around. And that's 15 years ago. So that's how it happened. That's, I wish I could say it was premeditated and I had this big plan and I'd done all this training and everything else. It was just, just a lucky break and, you know, how it happens sometimes. Well, where I really got in tune to it was when you and Rob Ryan were down here in South Florida for that Super Bowl. And I'm like, oh, I want to be there so bad. Hey, you now, you so know, I made the, it happen. The great. The greatest one we've ever done was when I was working for Sports Center, right? And they sent me down to do a, a the it was the Broncos and Atlanta in, in Miami, and they were looking for a location. They were trying to figure out what to do around the beach, and I said, "Okay, give me fifteen minutes. I'll, I'll have something for you." So what I did is I went to the lifeguard tower. And I got on the lifeguard's uh, little bullhorn, you know, that they have. And I said, uh, open auditions for Sports Center out of Canada, Super Bowl, again, <laughs> human telestrators uh, segment. Be here in five minutes. Well, you know what it's like. You know what it was. It's like moths to light, you know, when, when you get people. It was a beach, bum rush. Be on TV. Yeah. <laughs> be, be on TV. So they all like that. We must have had 50 people around the lifeguard shack. Right. And so now I got it. Now I got to come up with an idea. Right. So I said, OK, here's what I need. I need I need uh, I need 11 girls and I need 11 men. Right. And we divided them into teams. And then we we went out on the beach and we actually ran the Broncos waggle play, which is a bootleg play that Elway ran all the time against cover two. And so I would move people around like they were chess pieces, right? And they're in their bathing suits. And I mean, it was madness, but it was a big, big hit. And we had a heck of a lot of fun with it. That's probably my proudest TV moment. 
I could see it now. It's like Baywatch meets Longest Yard <laughs> or something. But you know, I showed up. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what it was. Yeah, I, I showed up to do the show at Bow Campers here in September. You know, Bow Campers Sports Bar in Fort Lauderdale, yeah. and they said we'd love to have you. Anything to do with the Dolphins, we're fine with. And I'm like, sure, yeah, let's go with that. And the show's been great, and they've had us make that. Hey, we only have time for one NFL question. We'll have to break it down next one. But for my Cowboys, I like the 49ers matchup more than the Cardinals on Wild Card Weekend. That's how I feel about the matchup. How about you? I think I think it's going to be an interesting game. I, you know, in my opinion, right? This is my opinion. Last night, Kyle Shanahan absolutely pencil whipped Raheem Morris. And I mean pencil whipped him if it was a 12 round fight they'd have stopped it at six rounds because he had they had no idea how to defend them and you know the thing that san francisco brings is a system that really really does a great job utilizing its personnel because they've got some guys in use check and kittle and debo samuel that are they can do multiple multiple things with those guys and so they really make it hard on you on defense. And you got to make, in my opinion, you've got to make Garoppolo beat you, right? You can't let the running backs beat you. You got to make Garoppolo beat you. And I am sure Dan Quinn will spend this week scheming up ways that they can get into eight man boxes and make Garoppolo throw the ball to win the game. Otherwise, if you do what Raheem Morris did yesterday, which is you know, basically nothing. I mean, he did, their, their adjustments were, it was an interesting. At the end of the game, they blew a coverage on the goal line on the touchdown that, that was really the deciding factor in the game. And I don't know if you caught it, but Jalen Ramsey went right up to Raheem Morris and jumped in his grill because he knew they were in the wrong, they were in the wrong stuff. And I think that's a, that's, that's really where the Cowboys are going to have to really do a great job scheme-wise on defense. And it's going to be Dan Quinn against Kyle Shanahan, you know, two guys that know each other extremely well. Yeah, and well, for the Rams might have just ticked them off because they're still in the playoffs, and they now have the Cardinals. So every matchup in the playoffs scares me for the Cowboys, always have. Coach, it's been nice to hey. have more time. Uh, thanks for this. It, it, it's, it's my pleasure. We're going to do this every Monday through the playoffs, I hope. Absolutely. Appreciate it, man. Stay uh, safe over there. And thanks for this. Thanks for staying. You got it, Rod. Aloha. Jeff Reinbold of the Montreal Alouettes and Sky Sports NFL Analyst. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the RP Show on YouTube. And don't forget, we're live daily on YouTube from noon to 2 Eastern. If you like what you see, hit subscribe. And if you like the program, check around for other segments of the Rod Peterson Show here on YouTube.